Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Thomas and this afternoon I'd like to um, share an introduction to how the device tree works, mainly on ARM. Um, it's not going to be a discussion on whether device tree is good or bad. Um, I won't try to repeat uh, what Tim did um, this morning during his keynote. So device tree is there, at least from the ARM architecture, for um, the best or the worst. Uh, we have to live with it and learn how to work with it. So I'll try to share, uh, for those of you maybe who don't really know um, how it works and how it is structured and what it looks like, um, a few information about the device tree. I'm not going to go into the deep details of doing complex device tree bindings and things like that, but at least introduce you to the, the basic concepts of the device tree. And I know there are a bunch of device tree people in the room. We can add more info if needed. So I work for free electrons. We do emit all next services and training. Uh, I mainly work on kernel uh, development these days on Marvel um, ARM processors, pushing the support for those processors to mainline. And that's in the context of this um, work that I've uh, been working since about two years now with device tree because we've pushed uh, the support for those SOCs in a pure device tree fashion. So we've been fairly early adopters of many of the new subsystems in the ARM world. Um, so we'll start with the user's perspective, um, look at the basic device tree syntax, an example of a de device tree fragment, then look at the bigger picture, the overall organization of a device tree file, examples of device tree usage and some uh, general consideration to conclude the talk. So before the device tree, in the ARM world, the kernel contained um, a complete description of the hardware in the form of uh, hard-coded C structures. The bootloader loads a single binary image into memory, the kernel image, and runs it. This image is either a U image when you use the U boot bootloader or it could be a Z image if you use another bootloader. And the bootloader, in addition to loading this image into memory and starting it, will prepare a bunch of information uh, called the at tags that encode information such as the memory size and location, the kernel command line, and a bunch of other information that the kernel needs to actually start running on this platform. The bootloader also needs to tell the kernel on which board it is running. And the ARM world has a, a concept of machine types that were uh, uniquely associated to each board or platform that exists. So this information were passed in two ARM registers, R1 and R2 respectively. And so you were booting with like uboot, bootm command, uh, a single uh, image that you loaded from flash or network or any kind of storage. So it looked like this. With the device tree, um, the idea is to take out the description of the hardware from the kernel itself and put it into a separate data structure. So the kernel itself continues to have drivers that know about hardware details, but it does not know exactly how your SOC on your board is laid out, which components it has, how they are connected with each other. So the device tree is mainly here to describe, well, the tree of devices that compose your processor and the board around it. And this data structure that we call the device tree blob, that's a binary form of the device tree, and I'll get back to that later, as to be loaded into memory next to the kernel image by the bootloader. So now instead of having to load just one image, you need to load like basically two images, the kernel image itself, which is pretty large, a couple of megabytes, and a device tree image, which is usually pretty small, a few dozens of kilobytes is a typical size in most cases. So the kernel image remains a U image or a Z image. When you build your kernel and it's, it's for a device tree capable platform, you will get a, a device tree blob somewhere in a, is, it, is that working? Oh, it's not. Seems like I'm running out of battery. That's okay. Um, so that will be in Arch ARM Boot DTS, and you will get one device tree blob for each board. Um, the bootloader will be passing the address of the DTB through register R2, and we no longer have um, the concept of machine type because now the entire description of the hardware is the device tree, and we don't have to convey this information to the kernel uh, in the form of just a, an integer. It's a full device tree. So when you boot a kernel this way, uh, you know that I have two images. So when you use boot M for U image or boot Z for Z images, um, you pass the kernel image and the DTB address. Um, the dash in between is uh, for the uh, init RAM disk address. So if you don't have one, you need to use uh, just um, a dash here because uh, the DTB address has to be the third argument of this common in, in U boot. So it would look like this. Basically, we have a DTB that's 
describes the hardware and that's communicated to the, to the kernel. So when the kernel will boot, it will find the, the address of this DTB and will parse this structure to find many informations about the memory, the peripherals that you have, how they are connected with each other, and things like that. Um, also, there is kind of a transition period where we have bootloaders that exist on platforms and they were um, developed and, and flashed at a, at a moment where device tree was not used yet on, on ARM. And those bootloaders typically don't support the device tree. So there is a compatibility mode offered by the kernel where you can append your device tree blob to your kernel image. So basically, you take your Z image, you concatenate it with your um, uh, device tree blob, just with cat. It creates a new kind of modified Z image, which you can either directly boot if your bootloader is Z image capable, or that you have to encapsulate into a um, U-boot um, image format, the U image, if your uh, bootloader is U-boot and only U image capable. And um, this way, the bootloader is completely unaware of the device tree thing. It continues to boot it in the old mode with attacks and the machine type and things like that. But from the kernel point of view, it's going to receive um, a device tree blob as if the bootloader was device tree capable. Um, the kernel also has an additional option mentioned here at the bottom, which allows the kernel to convert a few ATAX information into device tree information, such as the memory location and size, the kernel command line, that kind of thing, so that the communication of this information from the bootloader to the kernel works, even if the kernel is normally ignoring ATAX because we're booting device tree. So that, but that's normally only a, um, a compatibility mode. Uh, the idea is that um, um, platforms should now be using DT-capable bootloaders that uh, load a, a device tree in memory, and the bootloader is also normally uh, capable of making modification to that device tree to add things like a MAC address or other types of uh, board-specific information before passing that to the kernel. So what's the device tree? Uh, according to the, the Bible of the device tree, the EPAPR, uh, that's kind of the document that all uh, device tree people or fanatics, I would say, um, read um, for breakfast. Um, um, the, it's a concept, the device tree, to describe the system hardware. So that's what I, I've been saying. And the idea is that a boot program or bootloader, in normal speak, uh, loads the device tree into uh, the memory and passes the pointer to that to a client. And the client is, in our case, Linux. Um, it's a tree structure. Um, with nodes that describe the physical devices in the system. So we'll get back to examples. And um, it normally describes um, uh, information that cannot be dynamically detected by a client program. So uh, typically, if you have um, um, in SOC devices or I2C devices or SPI devices, they cannot be detected dynamically. So you would describe that in a device tree. However, if you have PCI devices or USB devices, those are normally um, dynamically enumerable, so there's no point in, in hard-coding those information into the device tree. So it's really for the things that the operating system cannot guess or, or enumerate from the hardware. The basic syntax looks like this. So it's a tree. We have nodes. Um, if someone has a working laser pointer, that might prove to be useful. Um, I know I have one, but it's done in my bag. Um, so it's a tree. We have nodes and child nodes and child nodes and child nodes in as many levels as we need to describe the hardware. Um, each node has a name that's um, uh, before the at sign. And then we have a thank you very much. Um, is that, yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so we have a, a name for the node, a unit address, which is typically the address at which this device is on, on the particular bus it's connected to. So it could be a, a memory address if it sits on the memory bus. It could be an I2C address if it's an, 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 on the I2C bus. Then inside nodes, we have an arbitrary number of properties. Um, it, they can contain strings, or a list of strings, or a list of integers. And then we can have child nodes, which in turn have um, uh, properties uh, in turn. Uh, there's one interesting thing that uh, the device tree allows is to reference other nodes. So if you have a device that's in some way connected to the other one, and then you can reference it. Um, we can also have labels, which is actually the mechanism that's used to provide this reference mechanism. So this syntax is called a p-handle. That's a reference to other, another node in the tree. So the basic syntax, I believe, is uh, pretty simple. The complexity lies in um, what properties, what node names to use to describe uh, 
specific pieces of hardware. Um, these uh, device resources on ARM are located in Arch ARM Boot TTS at the moment. And there has been a lot of discussion going on um, with the idea of moving that uh, outside of the kernel tree in some other projects so that it can be reused by others uh, such as maybe BSD operating systems or bootloaders. For example, U-Boot and Burbox have started using device trees as a way of um, describing the hardware so they can, it can be reused between the kernel and other projects around. But for now, they still are a part of the kernel sources. We have, um, in this directory, we have uh, DTS files and DTSI files. Uh, DTS files are um, typically used for bot level definitions. Um, and DTSI, which are actually include files, uh, device tree, source, include, uh, generally contain uh, SOC level definitions or definition common to multiple very similar boards. Because we'll get to it, but there is an include mechanism that allows to progressively specialize uh, the device tree representation of a piece of hardware. So that's, these are the device tree source files that uh, developers write. Then there is a tool called the device tree compiler that turns these sources, source files into a binary blob. We get to the device tree blob, or DTB, which is produced by DTC, the compiler, and that's actually the binary that gets loaded into memory by the bootloader and parsed by the kernel. So it's more efficient than just parsing a text file. And the kernel usually um, automatically builds uh, all the DTBs for the, the platforms that you have enabled support for in your kernel configuration. So if you look at Arch ARM boot TTS make file, there is a set of lines like this. So that's one of the platform I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, so whenever this option is enabled, all these DTB files will be produced. So whenever you build a kernel for those Marvel platforms, you get ARM, Armada 370 GB and Armada 370 Mirabox DTB files. Um, once you've booted a platform with the device tree, um, there is a way to explore the device tree on the running system to just check if it's actually the one you intended to use. Um, and this is in slash sys firmware device tree base. It used to be in proc device tree, but it's been removed recently and uh, proc device tree is now a symlink to this location in sysfs. Um, and in there you have basically a typical sysfs thing with directories and files that you can cat and cd and, and do things like that. It's also possible if you have DTC on the target, so if you have the compiler, it can also act uh, as a kind of a decompiler and turn it back into um, the, almost the tree representation that I've shown before. That's, that's pretty convenient to just check that you're actually running the new device tree you, you modified. So here is a, a more uh, specific example of a device tree node. So instead of looking at the entire tree, I just took one specific node. In that case, it's um, the node for an IMX28 um, um, SOC. So it describes a memory mapped um, IP block that's a UART controller in that case. Uh, so we have a name for it. The um, PAPR document gives a certain number of names that are kind of standardized. So if your device falls into these um, categories, use, use do's, otherwise it's well, left to be defined with the, 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 the binding, which we'll um, talk more later. We have the unit address, which here uh, matches basically where this, the registers for this IP block are located. And we have a, an alias that allows other nodes to make reference to that one. Um, we have different properties here, and most of the properties are actually uh, standardized by the PAPR document or by other bindings defined progressively by the Linux kernel community. So here we have the compatible property, which is one of the most important ones, because it's basically defining according to the PAPR um, the programming model for this IP block. Um, in Linux speak, it means just which driver is going to be responsible for handling that device. But the idea of the device tree is that it should be OS agnostic. So all the EPAPR language is not Linux specific, it's just saying that's the programmer model. So basically it's defined um, the fact that this IP block has a set of registers that behave in that, that way and that way and so on. And here we're actually compatible, um, have two compatible strings. So if we have an, an operating system that um, only supports the IMX23 UART, we say we're compatible with that one, maybe with a reduced set of functionality, um, but it, it, should, it should still work. The reg property allows to define register areas. I guess it's pretty obvious, the base address and the length. Interrupts defines the interrupt number. Um, 
we can also um, uh, define uh, DMA channels. And here we see a usage of P handles. Um, those DMA channels are offered by a separate DMA controller. So DMA APBX is a reference to a different node somewhere else in the device tree, which is this DMA controller. And we're kind of passing an argument here, probably DMA channel eight and nine, used respectively for RX and TX. And this thing, having um, references and then names, is uh, something fairly common in the device tree, so that uh, device drivers can request their uh, TX DMA channel and RX DMA channel, and not depend on, on whether the one is the first or the second, for example. We also have references for clocks. And same idea here, we have a p-handle to another node somewhere in the device tree, which describe the clocks in that system. And we have the st a status, which basically says whether the device is present or not. And in that case, the device is not present because we're in a DTSI file, so describing all the IP blocks inside the processor itself. But at this point, we don't know whether it's actually useful to enable it because we have no idea whether this UR is connected to the outside world. So that will be left to um, a separate DTS file. Um, so just to make the connection with the driver side of things, and that's the um, platform driver definition for that um, UART controller driver. Um, before the device tree, people were used to uh, look at the name here and create a platform device which had the same name. And the fact that the names are the same was the key to bind the device with the driver. In the device tree world, what uh, allows this uh, connection between uh, a node in the device tree and a driver is a list of compatible string that this driver is capable of handling. So it's not no longer just one string, but several ones. Uh, so in that case, this driver is capable of handling IMX28 and IMX23 UART controllers. So the fact that this and this is matching uh, means that the probe function of that driver is going to get called. So it slightly changes the, 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 the way, the, the connection between uh, the representation of a device is done with the driver, but other than that, the, the rest of the process of probing devices is essentially the same. Um, in this table here, we can also associate data, um, and you see that it's not the same data. So it allows, if your driver supports like two variants of the IP block to support those variants. So when in your probe function, you can get uh, a reference to the OF ID, which is basically the the entry in this structure here. Um, and you can use OFID data to differentiate which um, compatible string was used to probe uh, your driver. So there are, in many situations, um, uh, the same hardware block is reused in various processors, but the, the way it's connected to the rest of the system is slightly different. Maybe on, on one system it supports DMA and not on the other, so we can differentiate using the compatible string. And then in the probe function and in the rest of the driver, there is a, a fairly um, large API to retrieve information from the device tree. Um, a lot of the uh, common APIs were actually changed to, be, um, to provide device tree information in a fully transparent way. So if your driver is doing something like platform get resource, platform get RQ, DMA requests, slave channel, or clock get, that kind of things, um, it will automatically work with um, a switch to the device tree because those APIs will also uh, look at the appropriate um, um, properties in the device tree node. So that's why we have kind of standardized uh, properties for most of the common things like interrupts and reg and clocks and DMAs and so on, so that all those a common APIs uh, just work. So if you invent your own, then it, it, it won't work. Of course, there are many um, nodes for which we need to create uh, very specific um, device tree properties to describe something that's inherently specific to this IP block. And so there's a fairly huge um, OF something API. So in that case, OF get property will um, uh, let get you the, the value or at least whether it's, uh, the property is present or not. There are lots and lots of OF APIs to find um, um, properties, navigate through them, and, and, and make your uh, driver find out what's, uh, your, what's your device tree describing. Um, another important aspect of device tree is the fact that you, they can include each other. That's a very um, interesting feature because instead of having like um, one monolithic um, device tree describing your entire hardware, um, 
most of the time you have uh, like one SOC reused in multiple boards or and sometimes this SOC is part of a family of SOCs that have lot, lots of commonalities and just a few differences so you don't want to replicate that. So a device tree can include another one which can include another one and another one. And um, I would say that unlike um, C inclusion where it's basically just concatenation of text, in the case of the device tree, it's the, the different trees are being overlaid on top of each other. So if you have one device tree defining a property and then another one that includes that one that defines the same property, this one will win. So it allows to progressively refine um, the description of a hardware platform. And typically, as I said earlier, we have um, DTSI files um, includes for um, describing processor SOC level information and DTS for board level information. Those are the leaves of the, the, of the tree. Inclusion is possible either using the uh, DT specific operator slash include slash, or uh, since a couple of Kinal releases now, um, using normal C prep processor based inclusion with sharp include. Uh, in that case, and I believe it's not the preferred way, you can also take advantage of micro, macro expansion so that instead of having magic values all over the place in the device tree, we can have um, nice macros that get expanded. So here is um, an example of um, a well-known platform, BeagleBone. Um, we have in the AM33XX DTSI file, which describes the SOC. And we have the AM335XBone.DTS, which describes the board, so that one is including the SOC definition. And here we have the UR controller definition. And we have uh, the same node name here and here. So actually when we're going to compile that one into the device tree blob, it's going to look like this. So of course the device tree blob is a binary format, so that's not what it actually looks like, but that's kind of the corresponding text representation of it. And what we see is basically the uh, aggregation of all the properties here. So for compatible, reg, interrupts, uh, we find them at the same. And then we have two additional properties here defining the pin muxing that get added. And you see that the status was disabled here, but it's okay here, so the end result is okay. So in that case, it means in the SOC file, well, the IP block is a priori not used, but in the board, it's actually connected wired to something that's, that's used, so we want to enable it. So we override the status with okay. And you can do that in a more complex way. Um, that's the, the platform I, I actually work on, uh, Marvel SOCs. Um, there's a family of SOCs that have lots of commonalities. For example, these ones, they basically are exactly the same, uh, except that some have two cores, some have four cores, and they have slightly different number of like PCIe interfaces, but all the rest is the same. So all the common stuff is in here, and then we specialize only the, the few uh, differences in those DTSI files. And then we have the, the boards here as DTS files. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty common. So okay, we've seen a basic um, device tree node and how it's um, bound to a driver and the mechanism of including device tree files. Now there is a very important concept of uh, binding. Um, so the uh, Bible of device tree says um, um, this chapter, so the one um, talking about um, bindings. This chapter contains requirements known as, uh, known as bindings for how specific types and classes of devices are represented in the device tree. So basically a binding is a document or a specification that describes the set of properties and information you have to encode into your device tree to represent a given piece of hardware. And um, these days when you want to add a new driver in the kernel tree, um, you need to usually add a corresponding device tree binding which explains in the device tree how such or such piece of hardware should be represented. And a lot of discussion um, typically happens on the device tree binding, and we'll see uh, why later. Um, so the compatible property is actually what um, associates a given node in the device tree with its binding. So every binding document says, this binding document details what a um, device tree node using this compatible string or this compatible string should look like. It should have an interrupt node, it should have a reg node, it should optionally have a clocks node, and so on and so on. Um, so um, when you create a new device tree representation for a device, it um, should come with a device tree binding. Um, all the device tree bindings in the kernel are documented in documentation device tree bindings. 
Um, so for all of the um, drivers, or normally for all of the, of the drivers that exist in the kernel, there is a corresponding binding document that uh, has been written. And uh, there is a team of uh, device tree maintainers that are responsible for reviewing the new uh, device tree bindings and making sure they are, um, I would say, uh, in the spirit of uh, device tree, OS agnostic, that they comply with all the, the, the standard um, strategies that are used in, in other drivers and, and the standard logic. And here is an example of uh, binding documentation, um, um, uh, well, text file. Um, which is the one for the uh, UART driver I just used before. Um, so it lists basically all the properties that are mandatory or optional. In that case, there are no optional properties. Um, and then um, gives a small example and some notes. So it does not give any OS-specific information. It's not Linux-specific. Um, people from Bearbox or BSD uh, willing to um, use the same binding could use the same uh, binding specification. They would read that to know what's their own UART driver for this controller should understand as the binding. That's the idea. It's really the, the contract between the device tree and the uh, client programs, the operating systems willing to use device trees. Um, so now let's, let's have a look um, at the more um, overall organization of a, a device tree. We've looked at a specific node. Now let's look at the, uh, the bigger picture. So um, a device tree starts with a, a root node. Um, which is that one here. And it typically has um, some standardized um, top-level nodes, such as uh, CPUs for describing the CPUs in your system, a memory node which defines the location and size of the RAM or potentially multiple banks of RAM. It has a chosen node, um, which um, can be used by the bootloader to pass um, parameters, um, that's the, such as the kernel command line, for example, uh, to the kernel. It may have an aliases node, which allows to define shortcuts to certain nodes. And then uh, it has more, um, well, uh, not necessarily uh, standardized nodes to describe the buses in the, uh, the SOC and uh, nodes to describe onboard devices. So we'll look at uh, an example. So here I took the example of um, the IMX28 um, platform. I didn't take the uh, Marvel example because the bus is uh, very complicated. Um, here it's a bit simpler. So we have, uh, I stripped all of the devices definition and really kept only the top level nodes. So we have those standard ones, they are not really interesting in, for, for the discussion. And then we have the, um, the nodes, uh, the, well, the buses in the SOC, APB, APBH, APBX, AHB, which are actually the different buses that you can actually look at in the data sheet. So there's, you're normally a, a really strong mapping between the hardware um, organization of the devices and the representation in the device tree. So you could make almost a one-to-one -one mapping between the buses here and the representation um, on, on that, that slide. Um, and then in the, um, um, on the board side of things, we would find basically the same organization, but we would add more information to it, uh, such as the memory size, and then probably other uh, onboard devices, such as LEDs and, and uh, backlights, sound, the sound complex, that, that kind of things. Uh, you can also have, or you should have at the board level, a model property and a compatible property um, that will be um, used to know which part of the kernel is responsible for this board. And that's actually where I'm coming here. Uh, not only the device nodes have a compatible property, but the top level node also has a compatible property, which typically starts with um, a compatible string identifying the board and then one or several compatible strings identifying the processor, and you can have several of them, and um, from the most specific one to the less specific one, because the first one is, is analyzed first, and then if it doesn't match anything, it looks up the next ones. And this compati top-level compatible string is actually the one that is used to match your device tree against the, the um, specific sub-architecture in the kernel that's going to, um, well, take care of your platform, basically. So in the past, it was an, a, board, a board machine type that was used. And uh, now we have um, uh, compatible strings instead. So um, in different places of the kernel, for each SOC family, you have a machine start structure that's specialized for the device tree that points to a list of compatible strings it's capable of handling. So here, if I'm booting an FSL IMX28 or FSL IMX23 
um, platform, which matches that. It's actually the, the, the other callbacks in this structure that are going to be used to initialize the platform. Because one of the um, things that um, was, um, well, changed in the kernel together with the introduction of the device tree was the moving to a multi-platform capable kernel where we have a single image capable of booting on multiple SOCs, which caused some size problems and other issues. But it was one of the um, uh, desired change. And this compatible string allows to find out like which platform you're booting on. Is it a Freescale OMAP or I don't know, Marvel or Atmel or whatever SOC you're using? This compatible string, uh, top level one, can also be used for um, like board specific um, acts where needed. Usually um, the idea is to uh, get rid of them as much as possible, but it's not always uh, as easy as, as uh, say, just saying it. So you can do OF machine is compatible and see is if the current machine you're running in is compatible with this given string. Uh, so there's, as I said, a lot of OF calls for various um, use cases. Um, now let's look at a bus itself. Um, buses uh, typically come with um, a compatible property, um, a number of address cells, size cells, and potentially ranges. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So the compatible property will basically identify uh, the driver for the bus controller. So if your uh, bus is an I2C bus, the compatible string of the, the bus node is going to be the one identifying the uh, I2C controller, same for SPI or PCI, for example. Uh, there is a, also a special value that's used in um, many places, um, simple bus, which is used for um, basically simple memory map bus with no specific handling or driver. Um, so that's typically used for all mem many memory map devices on, on SOCs. Um, in that case, the child nodes will be registered as platform devices. Uh, while if you have an I2C controller, for example, then the I2C subsystem will make sure that the child nodes, which are actually the nodes that are connected to this bus, will be um, registered as I2C devices and same thing for SPI and so on. Um, next to that, we um, typically have a sharp address cells property which indicates how many cells, um, in other words, 32 bits values, are needed to uh, encode the base address uh, part in the reg property. So you have a reg property that defines um, usually the base address and the size uh, for memory mapped devices. But if you have, for example, i scorsi devices, there is no notion of uh, map memory mapping. Uh, there is a notion of slave address. So it's just um, one um, number, one integer that's used. So we have different um, uh, number of cells in the rec property for 32 bits memory map bus would typically be two, uh, one for the base address, one for the size, or for i 2 c buses, it would be just one because there's just a slave address to encode. Um, uh, slice cells is for the size part, so I said something wrong, sorry. Address cells will be uh, one for um, uh, memory map buses that are 32 bits and size cells will be one. Uh, there will be example that will be better by that, just my explanation. And then in addition to that, uh, you can have a range property. So that goes into the more complex um, situation where there might be an address translation between the child bus and the parent bus. Um, like they don't live in the same address space and when you have an address X in the child bus, it maps to address maybe X plus something in the parent bus. So that allows to explain, uh, to well, um, express this kind of um, um, uh, translations. So here is an example on the, um, still the same, um, um, platform, uh, IMX28, we have um, the AP, APBH bus that has a compatible string, simple bus, so it's used for uh, very uh, simple memory mapped um, um, buses. Address cells is one and size cells is one, which means that in every rake property we have basically two numbers, one for the base address, one for the size. The rake here is not useful, uh, just as a documentation mean. However, ranges here is important. An empty range property indicates that there is an identity mapping between the child addresses and the parent addresses. So basically any address here is the same as in the parent bus. But translation could be much more complicated. And then as a child node, well, we will have all the nodes, uh, all the devices that sit inside this uh, specific bus. Here is another example of a nice core C um, bus. So this node, is the one representing the I2C controller and its child um, um, devices on the bus. And it's typically inside uh, memory 
uh, memory bus because it's the I2C controller is typically um, well part of the, the SOC itself. And we have the same logic. We have a compatible string that identifies the corresponding driver. Uh, in this case, address cells is one because it's used for the slave address, and size is size cells is zero because there's basically no size, which explains why we have just one cell in the rake properties in the child nodes here. And then we define in similarly child nodes for each I2C devices on that bus. And when this, um, uh, when they will be registered as I2C devices, the compatible string will be used to match with the corresponding device driver in the kernel. And then we have, as you can see, other properties that are more specific to um, each and every um, device driver. Uh, Intrap handling is another uh, interesting example. Um, there is a standardized um, Boolean property called Intrap controller. When a node carries this property, it indicates that it is capable of handling Intraps. Um, there is a sharp Intrap cells property that indicates um, for this Intrap controller um, how many cells are needed to encode um, um, basically the Intrap reference. So it might be just one Intrap number, but in some cases it's more complicated. And there is also a standardized property called intrap parent, which is a pointer to um, the intrap controller for that specific device. So um, here is an example. So at the top level, in this case, they chosen to indicate that the um, uh, intrap controller for basically all devices, unless otherwise overridden in a child node, will be the equal node. So that's that one. This one is of course, associated to a driver thanks to a compatible string. And it says I'm an intrap controller thanks to this property. And says also that to reference an intrap in this controller, one cell should be used. So in all other nodes that want to encode intrups um, that are connected to this intrap controller, well, they will just, just, just use one number, right? And that number will be translated into something meaningful by the driver for this intrap controller. Um, a more complicated example I um, took from um, Tegra 20. Um, we have here um, the SOC. It has an intrap controller. It has an I2C controller, a GPIO controller. On this I2C controller, we have a bus that connects to an audio codec. And this audio codec has an intrap that comes back to uh, one of the GPIOs. So we have actually, uh, well, uh, several interesting intrap's in here. We have the intrups from the I2C controller going back to the uh, um, SOC intrap controller. We have the GPIO uh, controller have, having intrups, and we have the audio codec having intrups, right? So in um, device tree speak, the um, SOC description, remember, we're looking at the DTSI, would look like this. So we have our intrap controller with the register. So in that case, you see we have two pairs of, um, well, with yeah, two sets of registers. Um, it's an intrap controller, but this time around, we have we need three cells to encode an intrap number. And as you can see here, the I2C uh, controller has an intrap, and it actually needs three cells. And you see these um, macros; they are possible thanks to a C-based preprocessor, -pre well, C preprocessor-based includes. So they are actually expanded to integers that mean something useful to this um, intrap con controller. Uh, we have same thing for the um, um, GPIO controller. It has multiple intrups in that case, and I removed a bunch of them. I guess they are like eight intrups or, or so um, that are uh, connected to um, the intrup controller here. So these here describe this connection, and this here describes this connection in terms of intrups. And then at the board level, inside the I2C controller node, we will describe a child node that describes the audio codec. Whoops, I'm moving forward. I should be moving backward. The audio codec here. And um, here we are overriding the intrap parent because for this audio codec, it's not raising an intrap to the SOC intrap controller, but it's raising an intrap through a GPIO. Um, and in that case, so we have to look at um, the GPIO controller, and it says we need two cells to encode intrups. So in that case, we have only one cell and another cell. Yeah. So we're describing here the connection between the 
audio codec, and the GPIO bank. Okay. Um, well, the other properties are more well. These are really specific to the um, um, the audio codec. But other than that, we have the usual thing: compatible string, the right property, and giving the slave address. That's the same thing. There is a new um, standard property that um, can uh, allows you to do that in just one property. It's called intrup extended. It's basically the same as intrups, except that the first cell is a p and all to the intrup controller. So you can do the same as intrup parent equal GPIO and intrups equal blah, blah, blah in just one, one property. So that if your um, um, a given device has intrups going to two different intrup controllers, you can actually express that, which is not really possible with this syntax. Um, so some more uh, general thoughts about the device tree. Um, it's meant to describe hardware and not configuration. So um, typically encoding um, really how you are using the hardware is not what the purpose of the device tree. Someone using the same platform for other purposes should be able to use the same device tree. So as a typical example, the device tree can be used to describe whether a specific piece of hardware supports DMA or not, or supports this capability or not. But it's not meant to uh, decide whether you want or not to use this capability in your system. It should be done somewhere else. There are some kind of weird exception to, um, to this general rule. For example, um, um, flash partitions. Um, you describe your flash, um, NAND flash or no flash. And as child nodes, you can describe the partitions of your flash, even though those are not really a description of the hardware, but more how you, you, intend, to, you, you intend to use it. So it's kind of the, the edge here. But the general rule, as I've understood it, is yeah, hardware description and not configuration description. Another important thing, and probably the, how mm, oh, can I put that up? Um, the most annoying thing about the device tree is um, the, the fact that uh, device tree bindings is a contract that is supposed to remain stable over time. So just like the um, API, um, the system call APIs, so the contract that the kernel offers to user space libraries and application is supposed to remain stable over time. You can add new system calls. Uh, but you cannot like change or remove old system calls um, unless you have a very, very long deprecation uh, strategy. But normally, you don't do that. You just add new system calls. The idea with device tree binding is that once a device tree binding has been defined and used, the kernel should be able to understand this device tree binding for the time being. So this also means that um, you have to think twice, or three times, or five times, or 10 times, or more. Uh, before introducing a new device tree binding. Um, so this is um, really, really hard to achieve, I believe. Um, it has slowed down the integration of, um, of drivers and platforms. It's, my perception is that it has improved quite a bit over the last months. Uh, but still, um, it requires uh, people you know, having deep knowledge of the device tree to, uh, to review all those bindings and, and discuss with the, the well, the, the driver um, developers, um, how the hardware works, and what's the best way to represent that in the, um, in the, uh, um, well, in, in the device tree. So that this um, constraint um, also means that the kernel may, uh, over time, uh, carry some uh, legacy code to support all device tree bindings. Um, we already see that, I, at least on the platform I take care of. We had to change some device tree bindings because we made mistakes. Uh, we thought like some hardware block was working this way, but it's working slightly different way, um, slightly slightly differently. Like its register area is not exactly what we thought it was, so we had to fix that and still keep legacy code to handle that. So it's part of the of the device tree game. Um, the other problem, at least that I see with um, making bindings an ABI, is that I, since you have to think a lot to have make the perfect binding, it's kind of um, uh, killing the principle of iterative development instead of doing something simple to just handle the basic situation and then progressively, uh, as you understand better your hardware and as you develop more features, progressively improve your drivers. Here in that case, you have to do something, at least from the binding perspective, something perfect uh, from the first time. And it's, it's really, really hard. Um, took me something like six months to get a device tree binding for a PCI controller merged into the kernel. And it was really, really painful. Um, but 
Hopefully, as we go, we'll have more and more examples of bindings for other platforms. So when you come with a new platform that's fairly using fairly similar concepts, we can reuse the same ideas. So maybe it will improve over time, but it, it remains um, a difficult point from my point of view. Um, so some things I've learned um, while doing DI stream, maybe some other people will not agree with that. It's just my own perception here. Um, a precise compatible string is better than a vague one. Uh, some people have like, oh, I have uh, two SOCs and they have the same, um, like, I don't know, I square C controller. So I'm going to use some, um, I don't know, one XX type of compatible string because my 120 and 130 SOCs are using the same I square C controller. And then of course, uh, 140 shows up and your nice hardware engineers had the good idea of completely changing the register set and things like that. So the compatible string does not make a lot of sense. So the, um, the usual rule here is to use the uh, oldest SOC, uh, having this particular IP block as the, the key for the compatible string. So if you have like 110 and 120 using exactly the same I square C controller, name it 110, even though it's also used for 120. Um, and also um, a mistake that I saw being done f by other people, at least I believe it's a mistake, it's encoding too much hardware details in the device tree. Uh, some people started to, um, encoding things like register offset and bit masks and bit shift and things like that, just to make the driver more independent from the from the hardware and encode all the detail all the differences between slight variation of the hardware into the device tree. Um, the problem is, of course, that at least from my perception, uh, you're not aware of the next variants that are going to come up, and most likely they are going to be different in a way that is not cannot be represented with your device tree binding. So you'd better have um, different compatible strings and let all your driver and all that in um, uh, behind well behind the device tree contract because the implementation you can change whenever you want. The device tree binding, you cannot change. So if you make the device tree binding uh, basically as simple as possible, it's, I believe, uh, more likely that it, you will not uh, screw up in the future. Oh, I'm pretty much on time, it's cool. Um, future directions, more DT bindings for various subsystems. There are still areas like, uh, I'm not following much, but on the display side, it's, it's been, there has been discussion ongoing for months and months on how to uh, represent, um, well, basically graphics hardware. Uh, but it's, other than that, it's, it's, it's coming up nicely. Um, as I said, I was uh, one of the, the first uh, person doing uh, PCI um, represented in a device tree on ARM, and that was a painful experience, but I've seen uh, like, maybe five or six other uh, PCI drivers coming after that, and I believe the, the path to mainline has been a little bit smoother for them, so um, hopefully that's the same for other subsystems. Um, a tool to validate device tree again by, against bindings. In fact, the compiler only makes, makes um, syntactic checks, so it verifies that um, your um, device tree is, well, it uses the correct device tree syntax, but you can use com completely funky properties, there's no checking. Like if you make a typo on status equal disabled and you, re you I don't know, forget that it's disabled and you do it disable or you for when you do okay and you do a E instead of an A or something stupid like that, nothing will complain. It will just compile nicely and then you will wonder for many hours what's going on. There is none, not really type checking. Um, some people should, could could ask, but why are we using a specialized language instead of C, which has had type checking for uh, decades? That's a good question. Uh, but there are tools being written and worked on to uh, make that happen and have a more uh, formal uh, way of describing the binding instead of having just a, a simple um, text file document that is nice for humans, but not really nice for uh, uh, programs to parse, have a more formal description and then have a tool that is going to look at the binding definition, look at the device tree, and then make sure that you have the, the right number of uh, entries in your right property or uh, use the right possible values for, I don't know, clocks or status or whatever. And there is actually a talk from Thomas, um, uh, another Thomas, um, at this ELC. I don't know which time, but it should be um, the next days. Uh, there is also the uh, discussion of uh, taking out device tree source files from the kernel tree. This is going to be a huge step, I believe, because even though the DT bindings are supposed to be stable, in practice, people are breaking them all the time. 
Um, really, they are breaking them all the time just because maintaining uh, compatibility is horrible. Uh, like if you have a platform that was um, using um, hard-coded clocks representation and then the next kernel switches over to a device tree based representation for clocks, if you want to really, really keep the device tree binding compatibility, you would have to keep all the legacy code that was doing manual clocks. So of course, device tree people usually say, yeah, but it's an exception because they are in transition and things like that. But there are so many exceptions that, in fact, the compatibility is, is um, broken quite often. So I'm not sure we're there yet. But uh, there are some people pushing for that, mainly to reduce the amount of churn in the kernel sources. Because as you're probably aware of, one of the, the things that, that um, uh, triggered all this activity around device tree migration and new subsystem and cleanup of ARM is the, um, the rant from Linus about uh, the amount of churn in the, uh, in the ARM directory. So we've um, removed, I believe, a lot of churn in, in Mac directories, but we've added a huge amount of churn on, in uh, Arch ARM boot DTS. I don't know if Linus has noticed yet, maybe, um, but he will certainly notice one day um, that there's just moved things around, more or less. Uh, it's nicer, it's cleaner, but it's still a lot of things moving. Um, so maybe it's going to move outside of the kernel, but we'll probably raise a bunch of uh, compatibility questions. Um, some references, the slides will be online, so uh, feel you, you can access them when you need. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So if there is a mic somewhere or, or not. Yep, please. Yeah, I mean, the presentation addressed this so mostly from the arm side of things. Uh, is DDB is it compatible with other things? Um, the, yeah, the question is the presentation addresses the topic mainly from the ARM point of view. Um, is this, is, does this apply to other architectures such as x86? Um, uh, I'm an ARM guy, um, so I'm not able to say much about the other architecture. The basic principle of the device tree, the compiler, and the logic of device tree bindings and so on is uh, essentially the same on all architecture. So PowerPC and uh, I think mic maybe Microblaze and some of the other uh, late new architectures that have been introduced in the kernel use the device tree as well. Um, maybe it's even part of the requirements now to merge a new architecture in the kernel. I'm not sure if it's absolute requirement, but it's strongly suggested. So other architectures are using it. And for the most part, it's, it's exactly the same idea. The only thing that will ch change is the boot protocol and the way to pass the, the device tree to the kernel. But other than that, the rest of the logic uh, should be mostly the same. As far as x86 goes, I have no idea how it works on x86, unfortunately. Yep, please. Yeah, now, I think I try to see what you're trying to do with the device tree. It's trying to clean up the platform data because, you know, we've got the, uh, different types of devices with different approaches amongst the, the ARM families. Okay. Now, the problem that I see right now with the device tree is, is that, okay, so we're going to abstract the devices uh, a little bit more to try to make the drivers more uniform amongst the generations of ARM. Okay, but how do I know that when I'm looking at the device tree file that this device is going to be the name for the piece of hardware in my system? I mean, if there's a, it looks like there's a lot, still uh, all the intensive research on the register information and so on and so forth. How many bits? Uh, what's the IRQ and so on and so forth? And it's like, you know, is there a database someplace that will say, Hey, this is you know the SPI, uh, you know for the, the ARM9, okay. And this is the SPI configuration for let's say ARM11 or whatever. Um, I'm, so the question, I would to repeat that question because I'm not sure I really grasped the question to to, to tell the truth. Um, Basically, I, w I, I believe the answer to the question is that uh, uh, device tree bindings are actually um, um, defining which pieces of hardware can be represented by which, um, which binding. So a uh, device tree binding says this binding applies to the I2C controller or the SPI controller that you can find in this SOC or this SOC or where the IP is sold by um, this IP vendor. And then so when you have a new um, processor coming in and you have a data sheet, you can map the data sheet to um, the existing device tree binding. Maybe one hardware block in your processor is already supported by the kernel and you can reuse an existing binding. Maybe another hardware block in your processor will need a new driver, so you will need to define a new binding. Um, so essentially, the, 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 uh, the binding documentation is kind of your database of what is already supported by the kernel. Yeah, 
Yep. So if you have any other questions, I'll be around for the next two days. Thanks for your attention. And have fun with the device tree. <laughs>